Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus has the victory. We all have a call, a call to greatness, a desire for it. We want to do something good. Now is your time. You could change the world, and the world needs changing, so get busy. Shalom World, God's own channel. For the church to be what she's meant to be in the time of the new evangelization, it's got to be about men being everything God has called them to be and living their life in Christ with everything they've got. Our passion is to get men in the game all the way in. One of the biggest challenges we see, brothers, throughout the culture, and what we see both in the culture and in the church, we see a battle that's unfolding, and part of that battle in the spiritual battle is to knock you and me out of the game. It's to separate men from their families. So why? So that the children and the family are unprotected. That's the devil's strategy. We're living at a, how many of you think we're living at a kind of crazy time right now regarding family and roles and all the rest? Isn't it bonkers? I mean, have you ever asked yourself, like, what the heck is going on? Especially at a place like North Dakota, when I come here, you guys feel pretty normal. You know, this is like the normal life I grew up in Minnesota with, you know, like male and female, dad and mom and normal family life. But for some reason, for the first time in human history, for the first time ever, these fundamental realities are being thrown up for grabs. And we're living at this time, in this time of great challenge. When the society is actually trying to say and raise the question, do dads even matter? Are dads necessary? Aren't they replaceable? Can't people, can't we just redefine family apart from fathers if we want to, if that's our choice? It's astounding that we're even asking those questions. And then what's even crazier is you have experts who are coming forward in their little studies and they're trying to say, hmm, kids, kids can do well and just fine without fathers in the home. Let me tell you what Pope Benedict said about the time we're living in. We're at the end of the year of faith, right? Talked about today. Last night, Scott Hahn so eloquently put to us, what was the, what's the year of faith all about? It's remembering the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council, 20th anniversary of what? Catechism. The Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's another reason the Holy Father inaugurated the year of faith. In 2009, he said this, in vast areas of the world today, the faith is in danger of dying out like a flame which no longer has fuel. He said humanity, what we're witnessing, he said humanity is pushing God from the human horizon. And he said, when we push God from the human horizon, God who is light, if humanity in its freedom and its will says no to God and pushes the light of God from the horizon, what do we have left? Darkness. And he said, what's happening is, is darkness is setting in on the human mind. And he said, as a result, humanity is losing its bearings. How many of you feel like we're losing our bearings a little bit on fundamental questions? So you say, why is this happening now, what we're witnessing? Why such an attack on family? Why such an attack on fatherhood and being a man? Hollywood makes a living making dads look goofy, makes a living 
raising up men and fathers who are increasingly more feminized and unlike the kind of masculine, healthy, natural manhood that we're so used to understanding fatherhood to be. There's an attack on it. Why? Well, here's the Holy Father reading for us the signs of the times and interpreting for us what the Spirit is saying to the church. He's saying, listen, church, this is what's going on. There's a great spiritual battle that's going on. And the reason humanity is now living the way we're living is we're living as if God didn't exist. There's something going on. There's a spiritual struggle to suppress the truth about God. Romans chapter 1. St. Paul tells us time and again humanity always struggles with this fundamental battle to refuse to acknowledge God as God and to refuse to give him thanks. Humanity suppresses the truth about God. And so what we see is humanity suppresses the truth about the things that God has made, like human life in the womb. How many people are still running around the country trying to say that, trying to figure out when this baby becomes a human being? Isn't it crazy? It's so manifestly clear, the truth about it, but there's a conscious suppression of the truth. We don't really want to know. I mean, you do, Catholics do, but the reason people, quote-unquote, don't know is because they don't want to know. And they don't want to know because they want abortion to be the last, what, exercise of birth control if you need it that way. So I can't as a person honestly look in the mirror and saying, hey, guess what? I'm the kind of person that would literally kill its own child. I would never do something like that, so I'm too nice and too good of a person to do that. So what do I have to do? I have to obscure the truth of the humanity of that child. I'm not really killing a human being. I'm just killing whatever mass that is, that tissue that's not yet a human being. So humanity suppresses the truth. Is there a truth about family? Male and female, he created them. Now we're raising the question, is that really true? In Canada, just north of me in Ontario, by law now, you have to teach in every public school from kindergarten to 12th grade that there's six genders, by law. Six genders. Some are pushing for 12 and 15 genders. I'll give you 100 bucks if you can name all six. Doesn't that seem strange, you guys? What's more obvious than male and female? And why such an aggressive push to change it? There's, we're suppressing the truth about God's will and God's plan for human life, for family. Why? We're living in a spiritual battle, a big one, a very big one. It's something we cannot escape. We can turn on our TV and go, ah, just pretend it's not there because it can seem too discouraging or difficult. But brothers, we can't escape it. And what the devil's after is the same thing that the Lord's after. He's after eternal souls. Jesus Christ came to what? To seek and save the lost. What the devil wants is eternal souls, and the best way for him to get the most access to the most unprotected and innocent souls is to destroy the domestic church, the place where eternal creatures come to be, where God's image is born again into the world for an eternal destiny, and the devil wants them, and he wants to destroy them. But God's great plan and wisdom is to have a father and a mother united together, protecting and raising that child and teaching that child who God is, to mirror the dimensions of God, male and female, right? The image of God that's represented in that marriage. And then literally to stand watch and to guard and to raise them in the way of the Lord and to stand with them and love them. So, that very reality, guys, 
is what the big fight's all about. That's what's really going on spiritually. And one of the challenges is, and what we're seeing, is that many of the baptized, many baptized men are clueless. I'm just going to talk about men right now, because I'm talking mostly to men, and this is about fatherhood, that many men live, baptized men live in the world having no clue what's going on. They don't see it. Something feels a little bit wrong, but they don't realize the intensity and the clarity of the battle. And we're living in a culture that works really hard to get us to never think about it. Stay distracted, stay focused on your own comfort, stay focused on all the distractions you want for your life. Whatever you do is don't hunker down and don't get too serious about your spiritual life. Don't get too religious. Because if you get too religious, people think you're whacked, you're kooky. Stay nominal. Be minimalistic in your Catholicism and your Christianity. Don't be bold. Don't be strong. In 1965, just to give you a sense of where we've come from, in 1965, Senator Patrick Moynihan, anybody remember him? Anybody old enough to remember him? From the state of New York, Catholic boy. Commissioned by Congress to investigate, to look into what Congress said was an unsustainable crisis in the inner cities of our country. Unsustainable crisis. What was it? 27% of all African American children in America were born out of wedlock. And what Congress said was, this is unsustainable. This means a lack of education, this means economic trouble, this means crime, this means drugs, this means all of it. We've got to solve this problem. At the time, the general population was at 5%. Today, 73% of all African-American children in America are born out of wedlock. 41% of the general population is born out of wedlock. And for the first time, brothers, in American history, in 2010, 52% of all children in America born to women 30 and under were born out of wedlock. The majority of children to women 30 and under were born out of wedlock. Brothers, that is a ticking time bomb. This is what the Holy Father is sending up flares. Remember John Paul II talking about a culture of death? Remember how often he talked about that? What he meant was to say, when we turn our minds and hearts from God and the ways of God, and we refuse to acknowledge him and live according to how we're created, if we're left to our own devices and say, my choice, my life, I'm the master of my own destiny, I am my own creator, I can do what I will, when that happens, man will end up getting lost, and he will act against his own good, and he'll bring harm with the very freedom that God gave him to bring people in the world to the face of God and to freedom and goodness. Man will destroy himself because there's no life, there's no goodness, there's no hope apart from God and God's purpose for us. That's why they're sending up the alarm. And the culture we have, as I was saying, doesn't want us to think about it. There's this great poem by W.H. Auden that, that kind of explains to me and nails kind of how the culture works in this area. It's called Faces. And it goes like this. Faces at the bar cling to their average day. The lights must never go out. The music must always play, lest we know where we are. Children lost in the dark who've never been happy or good. Children afraid of the dark, he said, who've never been happy or good. Keep the lights on. Keep the noise going. Be busy. Let's, you know, every day I was just reading a, a Vanity Fair article two weeks ago. I wouldn't encourage you to read it, but how many of you, can I tell the truth, guys, how many of you guys have subscriptions of Vanity Fair? Let's get it up. You can't, no. But I was surprised because Vanity Fair, of all magazines, did an article just two weeks ago on social media and what social media is doing to redefine the relationships of the young. 
And they said that today, 81% or I don't know how they got that percentage, the vast majority of children 8 to 18 spend at a minimum 11 hours a day plugged into their smartphone, their computer, or the television. Wow. And Vanity Fair is shooting up flares and saying, hello folks, wake up. There's a lot of redefining of relationships and then they talk about what's happening in the social network and the kinds of things that they were describing. I almost fell off my chair. So in this time, brothers, like never before, the enemy or people who just want our kids' money, whatever it is, people have access to our children and to our families like no time in human history. So all of this is coming together at a time when you and I are living today as Catholics. We're being called into an enormous spiritual battle. Isn't that exciting? Does that sound depressing, you guys? Tell me the truth. How many want to just buckle up, let's grab our pickups and go hunting and forget about it all, right? That's how I feel at times, and that's normal. To just want to not think about it because it's really too big. I want to ask you, what's the solution? What's the solution to this problem? Anybody got an answer? God. Okay? Prayer. Eucharist. Evangelization. How many remember this morning what the Cardinal said about Poland? What happened for 17 minutes? What did they say? I think that was a prophetic moment for me. We want God. We want God. Let's say it together. We want God. We want God. In many ways, what Pope Benedict is saying, our culture is saying, we don't want God. Because if we have to have God, then we have to have those silly commandments, and it ruins my weekend, and it takes away my freedom, and the happiness that I think I can pursue, so I'd rather not have you on the horizon of my life. That's the exchange that's going on. And what needs to happen, and I believe it needs to come from the heart of the whole church, but it needs to come from the heart of men. Because what I have seen here in the States and around the world, when men have skin in the game, when men have become disciples and they look to Jesus to define for them, what's the meaning of my life? Jesus, you tell me what it means to be a father. I want to live under your lordship. When that happens, it's a total game changer. Because unlike anything else, the great protection for the family is mom and dad, but it's particularly dad, to defend that home, to defend mom and to defend the children, and to be present as a warrior. Every Catholic man was born into Christ, and that means you were born into his role as king, and to defend and to fight against all that is evil that tries to come into your home, the place that he's established for his glory, right? How many of you have Bibles with you? I want to read a passage. Understand here what... Romans chapter... Two passages I want to talk about. Romans chapter 14. This gives you a little insight, I think, for us, the way forward. This is St. Paul. He says, none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. But while we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. This is, a, this is the mind of a Catholic, of a Christian. I belong to Jesus Christ. I don't just pay my dues on Sunday. I'm not just out to be a good guy. I know the Lord of the universe. 
And he's called me into relationship with him. And he's brought me into the great war that's unfolding in the world that I inhabit. And in this world, the world is trying to put me to sleep. It's trying to get me to think about myself and making life fun for me. Make myself happy and not to see the battle that's going on around me and the consequences of that battle. Paul goes on, listen to this. For to this end, or another way, for this reason, Christ died and lived again so that he could become Lord of the dead and of the living. What's, what he's telling us, what, why did Jesus Christ die and rise again? So that he could be the Lord of everything. He's already established in heaven as Lord of everything now. He said, all power and authority belongs to me. What is Jesus doing right now, folks, in heaven? What's he doing? What does scripture tell us? He's reigning in human flesh, in glory, right now. What is he doing right now? He's interceding for us. What else is he doing? St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, you guys, is that he's subduing all the enemies of God. He's subduing all the enemies of God. What does that mean? What does that mean? Jesus Christ came to the earth, friends, to break the power of rebellion against the Father and the Father's kingdom. He came to establish the kingdom of God. And through his death and the shedding of his blood, he made it possible for humanity who is separated from God to be united again to the Father and to come and live in his kingdom. The church lives between the two comings of Jesus Christ. The first time when he came as a lamb that was slaughtered for our behalf, on our behalf. He came to shed his blood. Do you see how serious the situation is that we're living in? Father Conte La Mesa, the preacher to the papal household, puts it this way. Sin's nearness to us has provoked God's remoteness. God who is holy cannot be united to what is unholy. Jesus came, Paul tells us, to cleanse us from all that separates us from God, to deal with the sin problem, which produces the death problem. The devil did, St. Paul said, the one thing he never should have done. He always bites his own tail. And guess what? He's going to bite his own tail in our time too, and I'll explain why. But the devil always bites his own tail. He did the one thing he never should have done when he crucified Jesus Christ on the cross. He shed the blood that makes us clean. Paul said he cleansed us with his blood. And then God could draw near to us, and God comes and lives in us now. That's why the apostle 1 John said, hey, you guys, Here's what we want to tell you. What we've seen, what we've touched, what we know in our bones, the eternal life that was with the Father, it's here. We saw something the world has never seen. And it's in a person, Jesus Christ. And he's come to give us eternal life. We have seen existence beyond death. We know the future of the human race. We know the human story. We know how it's going to end. We saw his glory. So he came as a lamb and a time of mercies upon the world now. But you say it every Sunday, we're going to say it tomorrow. But he will come again to do what? He will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is what's really going on in the world, friends. Mercy, the mercy of God in Jesus Christ has been given out for the salvation of the world. The Catholic Church exists between the two comings of Jesus Christ. And we who are sinners, forgiven, healed by God through the mercy of the work of his church, we've been brought into right relationship with God. And now we who have received mercy go to the whole world and say, come and receive mercy. Come and receive mercy before it's too late. Because when the king comes again, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 is what he's going to do is he's going to take all those who refuse to acknowledge God and to give him thanks, and they will be cast out. 
And those who have bent the knee have said yes to Jesus Christ. And God's mercy, as it's been offered to the world, will receive eternal life. That's what the Catholic Church understands about reality. That's why we have priests. That's why we have celibates. That's why we have people. The world looks at a priest and looks at religious sisters and says, what is with these people? Are they kooks? Who are they? No sex? Why, why would you not have sex? Are you, you got a problem? Because we've lost an eternal perspective. We've lost the sense. What a, what a celibate says is, God's given us a wonderful creation, and it is good. And it's good for us to receive God's goodness. But never forget, folks, time is short. The clock is ticking for everybody. And human history is headed toward a great banquet between the Lamb and all of his people. And they bring us God's life, and they preach the truth to us. Why do you think the devil's attacked the fatherhood of the Catholic priesthood? with such aggressive force in this time and trying to undermine it, trying to undermine its authority and its confidence. So here we are, you guys, living in this great battle. So Romans 14, 7, great meditation. He's come so he can be Lord of your life. What does that mean? A few years ago, I was sitting in my living room praying and I... Uh, I was reading my Bible, and uh, I just was kind of trying to meditate and ask the Lord, you know, Lord, you, you wanna, I was reading this passage, do you have anything you want to say to me? And I got this picture in my mind, you guys, it was like a very vivid picture. I was sitting at a poker table, a Texas Hold'em poker table. Anybody ever play Texas Hold'em? Okay, good. There's a few guys who admit it. All right, way to go. No. I'm sitting at a Texas Hold'em poker table, and Jesus is on the other side of the table. And I got all these stacks of chips in front of me. And I look down, and each one of these stacks of chips represents some dimension of my life. 